working with high achievers and entrepreneurs, the reason many of them became successful is if it's gonna have to get done, I'm gonna have to do it myself. At some point, that's a glass ceiling. You're not yeah. gonna be able to grow and have the impact that you wanna have if you're just doing everything. This is Elevate with Jack DeLosa. This episode is all about leadership. If you want to become a better leader, you want to become a more impactful creator, you want to become a more inspiring leader, you want to scale your business or create a beautiful family, it all starts with you. Today's conversation is very powerful. I'm with Brad and Jenna Ballard from Ascension Leadership Academy, and we're talking about self leadership. Brad and Jenna bring decades of experience helping individuals grow into their best leadership selves. And in it, we discuss what are the core patterns that keep people small? What are the core patterns that keep us trapped? And ultimately, how do you step into your power to become the best version of yourself possible and the best creator possible? This is a very profound episode. I'm Jack DeLosa. And this is The Elevate Show. Brad and Jenna, thank you so much for being here. Thanks Happy for to be having here. us. Thank you. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. And the reason is, is that everybody I speak to that's done Ascension Leadership Academy says that it has fundamentally changed their life, changed themselves forever. And I'm talking successful people, Cameron Biafore, Ashley Han, Lewis Howes, you know, the list goes on. So the question I've been dying to ask both of you is, what the hell are you doing in these <laughs> programs to produce this level of transformation that's going on? You want to start first? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think that the to really condense it down, to really explain the context of, of what we are creating for people – um, is a level of self-awareness and presence, um, consciousness about how they show up and how they don't show up, things that are standing in their way, the ability to see what's in your blind spots because we all have things in our blind spots. And, you know, the, the personal development world is very interesting because I often see this, this promise that, you know, you'll be free from your ego or you're f once and for all with plant medicine, you'll, be, you'll kill your ego and that'll yeah. be the end of it but your ego is with you for the rest of your life. Yes. And so we really teach people how to be in partnership with our ego because I believe that our ego is our most powerful compass. It shows us who we don't want to be. It shows us who we authentically are not. Wow. And, and so we really give people the opportunity to create that distinction. And we, we stand for authentic leadership because we definitely have a shortage of that in the world. So mm. that's, our, that's our biggest stand for people. Mm -hmm. Our ego is our most important compass. I've never heard it languaged like that before. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. You know, I, I think that contrast is also an incredible compass as well because when we experience contrast or we experience our ego or we get triggered, it's an indicator of who we don't want to be. I mean, if I'm... And the work we have to do. Absolutely. But it's right. never... And it's never over. And right. that's... And I love... My favorite person to coach is the person who's done all the who things. Th who thinks they're Right. Alive. Like, they're like... They've been to Tony Robbins. They've, like, <laughs> sat with the gurus in, you know, like, deep South America. And they've... I they've done all the work. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm healed. I am. I've I have arrived. I've had an ego death. And let me tell you all about my ego. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the ego really? that I don't have. Yeah. Like... <laughs> and because they'll they'll come to ALA and and every single time they're like, wow, this is the most powerful experience I've 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 had with personal development and and I and I don't want to say that ALA ALA is not the way it is it is a way to access transformation I think mm. that um, they all go hand in hand plant medicine meditation mm. yoga uh, books I mean it, it all it all works. Mm. But I've never experienced anything that will take you from where you are to where you want to be as quickly as the process that we have at LA. I'm a big fan of uh, rather than trying to kill the ego, which, mm -hmm. as we've stated, isn't possible, integrating the ego healthily. Sure. I'll say it again. I've never heard it language, which I'm loving, as you can tell, that, that, it, that it's a compass and, and as you say that, it really kind of resonates with me at a really deep level that we can utilize 
the ego and what it's throwing up as a compass for what might not be resolved yet, what might mm-hmm. not be healed, what work we have to do, where we don't want to go, environments that are no longer serving us, whatever it might be. How would how how does someone or how do you guys teach people to use the ego as a compass? Well, I think the first part is one we take it from our blind spots and bring it in front of you because mm. we have people that you know some of us are aware that like oh I'm I'm a control freak or you know I procrastinate or I can come off cold and disconnected. But many of us we have things also that hang out in our blind spot when you're hanging around enough people and they go did you know this about yourself or do you know you come off this way? Yes. They go really? And right. the environment that we create in ALA is people are giving direct and honest feedback about how you are showing up. And the type of people that we work with are generally leaders that are their lives are working, they're up to a big game. And the, the good part about that is they're making a significant difference in the world. But the difficult part of that is most of those people are surrounded by people that really can't give them unfiltered. Absolutely. Because they have leverage. There is a consequence to being hundred percent honest with them. So we create an environment where honesty is, is, is really, really a valuable tool. And we acknowledge it and celebrate that honesty of like way to be honest, way to care about them enough to tell them what's in their blind spot or really how they're showing up. And it may be different, especially for people that are surrounded by yes, people in every area of their life. 100%. I'm often having this conversation with entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and high Mm -hmm. achievers in that, guys, we need to realize we don't have the same feedback loop that a lot of other people do because the people that often are around us don't feel, even if we, even when we say to the, our team and you know perhaps even our friends in some instances, if you're a leader amongst a friendship group, maybe they're not being completely honest with you. Mm-hmm. Even when we say to our team, guys, I want you to be super honest with me. I want you to be candid. I want you to give me full candor, full honesty. Even then, we still need to assume that we don't have that full feedback loop that, that perhaps other people do. Mm-hmm. And then I suppose to add to that, the other thing is with entrepreneurs and high achievers is that we are also quite good at believing our own story. So, of course. So, so a lot of the time yeah. we don't have the feedback loop in our own self, nor are we getting it externally. And so we, we you know, delusion can form. Yeah. And you take like high achievers where they're like, you know, feedback they might get. It's like, you know, you're, you're kind of controlling, you're bulldozing, right. you don't really listen, you only hear your own ideas. Yes. A lot of people at high achievers, they go, I, I don't see the problem with what you're saying. Right. Until you have a three-year-old daughter or son that's looking at you and going, "Daddy doesn't really listen. Yes. Daddy's not here," yes. or you know, and those types of things. And that's that's what makes ALA successful is we start to see and and start to connect the dots that some of these things they're not just affecting your business, but the things that you've been able unable to create the level of success that maybe you've had in business, like why is relationships, why being a parent at the level that you want to be, why has that been almost untouchable or on that? We start knocking down those walls and showing them how the working with the ego on that, although it may be a great vehicle in one area, it's not going to get you where you want in this other arena. Yes. And when they start seeing that, and they start getting the relationships that they've never really been able to achieve and start getting passion and intimacy in it and yes. in those types of things with their partner of 20 years. And yes. they bring that back to life in the spark. That's when they really dive all in and go, wow, yes. there, there's there's another level that I didn't know about. And let's go. Let's dive in. Right. Because, the you know, one of the things that we're often coaching, again, entrepreneurs and high achievers on is there's nothing wrong with the external pursuits. There's nothing wrong with living in a beautiful home that's a great expression of who you are. There's nothing wrong with driving a car that you love. There's nothing wrong with any of this stuff. Mm-hmm. The question is, what fuel are you using to get there? Mm-hmm. And if and when you get there, how fulfilling is it? Because often I think when we're pursuing this external stuff to fill a void, it's a bit of a mirage. We get there and we think to ourselves, well, that didn't fill the hole. And often that can be scarier than when you were pursuing success initially because at least you used to have this mirage that you thought was going to band-aid the empty hole that you have inside of yourself. And now you've actually arrived there and you've determined that Mm -hmm. creating external success doesn't actually give me the level of fulfillment that I was seeking. And that can be a scary point as well is a lot of what you guys do helping you know these type of leaders and ceos and executives and entrepreneurs 
uh, connect deeper with themselves and others? Absolutely. I, I think the one of the most special parts about the journey that people experience through ALA is they fall in love with humanity all over again. Mm-hmm. Like the, the mm. illusion of that it's us versus them, that we're separate from anything mm. becomes exposed. I mean, there's no separation. There's no such thing. It's an illusion. And so people being able to really fall in love with themselves, fall in love with humanity, fall in love with perfect strangers. I mean, you'll, you'll see these people coming into this room. They don't know each other, perfect strangers. And after just seven days, they're like family for the rest of their life. Yes. And to be able to share this kind of transformational experience and have this level of awareness. And, and it's also the biggest thing about ALA, it's, it's not mostly lecture. There's a little bit of lecture, but it's mm-hmm. very experiential. It's very uncomfortable. It's confrontational. It's an uprooting of limiting beliefs, the ones mm. that you think that you've already dealt with. And then, oh, that's coming up again. Mm. Um, it's fun, dancing, screaming, mm. yelling, catharsis. It is it's the full spectrum of life condensed in seven days. And so you get to experience this wild roller coaster with people that you didn't know. Mm. And, um, and, and it's really, it's, it never gets old. I mean, we've, we've hosted over a hundred live events. I mean, well over that, that, more than that. Um, it never gets old watching people, especially like the tough ones who come and they're like, I've done all the things and I know, and I'm, I've arrived. And like the best part is that there's no such thing as arriving because there is no there, there's no mountaintop. And we really teach, (laughs) there there, there isn't like wherever you go, there you are. So it's like, we really teach people to find deep reverence. Like that's the biggest thing is reverence for the present moment. And and how they can have every present moment be the most valuable moment. And there's no, there's no destination. I mean, all we have is right now, what's right in front of us. Mm, mm, that's really profound. I'd like to talk about, you know, some of the, the strategies and the tactics that, that, that you guys teach to these people. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that I've found being in business for 18 years and, and doing a lot of coaching and training is uh, after a while, you start to see fundamental universal patterns rise to the top in terms of core bottlenecks, core glass ceilings, core unlocks, all of that kind of stuff. What are the core patterns that you guys see that hold people back? It's a great question. Um, A fundamental level, trust. Lack of trust. Uh, uh, Yeah, a lack of trust at some level, either trust in themselves or trust in other people. And especially like what you were saying with high achievers and entrepreneurs, the reason many of them became successful in their a a limiting belief or fear that they're using as a tool is if it's gonna have to get done, I'm gonna have to do it myself. Yes. Well, as you know, as you're growing a company, at some point, that's a glass ceiling. You're not yeah. gonna be able to grow and have the impact that you wanna have if you're just doing everything by yourself or not allowing the talented people that you are bringing into your company and bringing into your vision and then suddenly strangling their gifts out of them to try to make them little versions of you running around. <laughs> exactly what so I- the lack of trust <laughs> and, and, and watching how that permeates in every area of their life, I think that's a huge one. The other one I'd say, you know, speaking to victim, just victim to yeah, that various this, things. this thing or that thing happened to me and I believe that everything happens for us, not to us. Yes. And when we can identify that, like truthfully look at the, and also be in the, be willing to be curious. Like mm. not why is this happening to me right now, but actually mm. what is this teaching me? Mm. And how is this designed for my evolution? And how is this a part of my growth? And how is this going to make me a better leader? Um, so it, I think that that's one of the biggest limitations that people experience mm. is not finding gratitude for everything that they encounter. And, Absolutely. And, and and also like what you were saying to husband, babe, um, <laughs> that, you know, like lack of trust. Like yes. it, it, it's, we got to be able to trust the timing of everything and know yes. that we are right on track. Right. Let's dive into each. I think I think they're both really fundamental points. Let's talk about trust for a little bit. And I suppose this is a two-part question. What are the symptoms of somebody who doesn't trust themselves? What are the consequences? And and the second part to that question is, how does one start to develop and foster Mm. Mm self-trust? 
When someone doesn't trust him or herself, I think one of the biggest things that is a consistent pattern in their life is self-sabotage. Mm. Um, not taking risks, mm. not being bold enough, brave enough to go for it, whatever that is. Um, yes. and, and, and when I witness people in this cycle or in this patterning of I don't trust myself, therefore I create perfect opportunities for me to be right about that. Because this is also an egoic mind pattern, like mind control thing, where you you got to create these things to have your ego be right about the things that you believe. And so if I don't trust myself, then I'm going to date people that I'm going to question, I'm going to waver, mm. I'm going to, uh, oh gosh, I don't know, should I say yes, should, I, should we go on another date? And 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 being able to also use our bodies as our as I'm like touching my belly, <laughs> which for those of you listening, I'm very very pregnant right now. And, I might go and, into labor and, on this podcast. And a beautiful example of trusting <laughs> yeah, oversell, right. Jenna, being in Timing's that, perfect. Is yeah. the ultimate example yeah. of this. I'm trusting this baby will arrive after this podcast. Yeah. And if it um, arrives in the meantime, we're yeah. prepared. We're ready. <laughs> um, but I I I think that we get to also remember that our bodies are like tuning forks. The universe, our higher selves, God, source energy, the universe is always communicating to us by communicating through us. So one of the most powerful ways to begin trusting yourself is to attune that fork and listen. Like, what are the physical sensations I'm having in my body? Why does this feel this way? When was the last time I felt this way? Um, and, and also being able to distinguish between this is – an absolute red flag or this is just old fear coming up. Yes. And so so really being able to practice that and it does take practice. It's it's it is something that I've dedicated my life to, being able to listen to the indicators, paying attention to the physical sensations in my body. What is this what is this telling me right now? What does this feel like and when did I feel this way last? And when you say practice, what what I'm assuming you mean is um Tune into how you feel, become attuned to whatever's going on in your body and, and, and use that as your comfort. And, and, and when you start to do that, recognize you will do it imperfectly and you won't always be right. But in, in, in trying and succeeding and in trying and in not succeeding, you'll eventually build your discernment around tuning into your body and what it's actually telling you. Is, is, is that what you're... I would say being committed to utilizing every experience as a part of your transformation and your growth because that's that's what everything is, right? I mean, everything's a choice point. We always have the opportunity to learn from every experience that we have. And so when we feel the butterflies in our stomach, when we meet a new person and we're dating, uh, we're on the dating scene. Thank God I'm not on the dating scene anymore. <laughs> Thank God we're married and all the things. Um, but I'll just, I'll just begin to this. So when yeah. I met Brad... I felt we were texting like for a couple months, I mean, before we actually finally went on our first date. And so we kind of had a really easy way to get to know each other. And, mm. um, and, and so when I met him, I didn't feel this surge of anxiety or butterflies. Like mm. I, felt, I felt at home. Like I felt very mm. safe with him. And, and I used to make, this, make up this story that if I feel the butterflies, that's – that's exciting or like that's that means that this is the person or but it's that I really got to discover that those butterflies it's like when you're going on a roller coaster your body's actually not safe in the moment right so you're you're feeling the butterflies you're like holy crap I might die but you don't die everything's fine and yet we literally pay money to feel this way or we <laughs> go on dates with psychotic narcissistic human beings and we to have feel this way. to feel this way right and so we think that the thrill of that is is like what we want to chase but it's really the the attunement the the presence the awareness the calmness the gosh this feels this feels so comfortable and this I feel at home. So I felt at home with him. And it took me a while to learn that that, that was an indicator that this is that I'm right on track and this is the person for me. And we knew on our second date that we'd be married. So yep. really, wow. really paying attention to that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. When we start to talk about this, I find that a lot of the question that comes up for people is when I'm in a situation uh, where I'm feeling a little bit of trepidation. You know, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to move to a new mm -hmm. country, start the next business, enter the next relationship, whatever it might be. I feel a little bit of trepidation. How do I discern between what is fear mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. perhaps from old trauma or fear that you know is there that to be worked through versus intuition that's encouraging me to pause or stop or go the other way. I would say the biggest thing that I've been able to uh, in my own discernment and how I've been, and this is not true for everybody, but this yeah. is true for me. Uh, when I feel some kind of a physical sensation in my body that I'm feeling is uh, like a, a fearful kind of experience or butterflies or like this is a red flag or whatever, I'll ask myself, when have I felt like this before? What mm. does this remind me of? When was the last time I felt this way? And when I experienced this before, was the thing that I was afraid of, did it actually occur? Mm. And I also ask myself, is what I'm thinking right now based on any fact whatsoever? Am I actually creating and generating this fear? Or is this something that is, this is literal. This is like, I literally have the data right in front of me. Because oftentimes we create this, this fearful conversation of, oh, well, if I buy, you know, I'll be extreme. If I buy this house, I might run out of money and then we'll be Mm. homeless. Mm. Or um, if I move to this city, it's not going to work out and then I'll completely uproot my life and and based on what facts. So we also got to pay attention to, of course, we have experiences in our life that that support us in navigating and managing other experiences we'll have again in the future. But it's really important to be able to ask ourselves, like, is this true? When was the last time I felt this way? And how did I navigate it last time? And that speaks to the practice principle you were talking yeah. about before is actually utilizing past experiences and when you felt this way before and, and how did that actually play out? Mm-hmm. So you're uh, l- learning. You, know, you, I think you said earlier, utilizing every experience as a transformational opportunity. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great example. And I think it's what you were saying is noticing the patterns in yourself and and seeing that is, do I make just illogical, irrational decisions for the thrill of making them? Is that something mm. I do? Mm. And if you have a more measured, if you're a more calculated person, you can say, no, I, I genuinely don't make bad decisions for that. Or if you're just this thrill seeker that loves to change things, you go, yeah, maybe this is just me. I'm bored in my life and I'm looking to shake something up because things are going too well. Yes. And I love to sabotage or I love to do that because I love that thrill of the 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 moment. I love the the roller coaster type effect in in yes. that and that's awesome for you. Yes. But as you're a, 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 a someone who has a company that's not very fun for your right. employees or people. Or if you're in somebody who's in relationship and you're, you're used to this drama, tumultuous thing where it you know, burns hot and it's fast and all that, it can be at times you've got to look at yourself and go, am I just blowing up a really good relationship just because I'm looking for that hit in that moment and in the moment going, okay, what's true? What's my pattern? What do I normally do in these things? And it's not right or wrong. But is this going to actually get me to what I'm 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 wanting to achieve, what I'm wanting to create, and that I think the more you practice and the more you start feeling that in your body, mm. you know, if people are never risking and you're never pushing into your edges, you're mm. never giving yourself the opportunity to really grow your intuition, mm. so that when you get in those moments, when you get like fear and that, you can go, oh, this definitely isn't that. I need to either hit the eject button or on the other side, you go, oh, this is familiar. I get this. Yeah. When I go down the roller coaster, like you said, I get the butterflies, I get the things. I know what this is. This is awesome. We're fine. I'm going to, you know, we're going to get to the bottom. We're going to go through the loop-de-loop. We're going to spin. We're going to be great. (laughs) This will be that. And we're going to want to do it again. Yeah. I think a lot of people watching this, listening to this, will be able to relate to that to a huge degree, whether it's. Uh, looking for the butterflies and you know all of the intense feelings going into a date or into a relationship or or, or trying to bring extremities and drama into their business uh, you know I find that until we do the work again entrepreneurs high performers can be people of extremes and, mm-hmm. and, and create that drama because in some ways it gets us present it gets us excited it gives us something to work on where does that need for extremity or the aversion to moderation and balance come from? What's the root cause of that? And if somebody's watching or listening to this now going, geez, I I do that when I start to date a new partner or I do that in my business, how do we help them understand where is that coming from? 
Childhood events. Thank you. Childhood events. I'm, I'm not going to say every time because there's going to be one person that's a out lot there. It's of like, the time. It's not, but yeah. yeah, yeah. And and how you grew up with mm-hmm. generally mom and dad or your peer group or the environment when you were a child. Um, if you were a person that had parents that fought, you, we have to realize that what becomes our comfort zone and what becomes known may not be the healthiest of environments, Mm. but if you've grown up in a lot of drama, if you've grown up in a lot of fire and a lot of noise and all that, you sit and go, oh, this is familiar. I know this dojo. I know what to do here where peace and tranquility and all that, maybe you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Maybe you're waiting for the chaos to happen and suddenly your internal compass goes, I'm tired of waiting for it. So if I can't find it, I'm going to create it and I'm going to blow it up. But Generally, whatever your alarm bells are, whatever those things inside of you that have that, it comes from our, our, our childhood. How does one develop to the point where they don't find the peace boring? Becoming emotional intelligent. Mm. You've got to become smarter than your emotions. Mm. Meaning that where in those moments you can take a breath and say, is this really going to create, is this fire going to create what I want to create? Mm. Or is this going to blow it up Mm. and do that? We all have our emotions. It's just energy in motion. Mm. And it's recognizing that is this energy that I'm feeling in the direction at which I'm wanting to put it in going to serve me for what I want to create. And that's what we teach. That's what we teach with emotional intelligence mm. is being smarter mm. than your emotions in that moment. And if it's not going to to do it, shift. You know, you, you, with with the people that are listening, you're likely a high achiever that is, has really thrived on competition, mm. thrived on winning. Mm. That was my story. Mm. Until I figured out in relationship, if I got in a disagreement, I didn't want to win. My ego did. My ego wanted to be right. My ego wanted to to walk out and go, oh, I made the best point in that uh, argument. I won. And then you're looking at a partner that's just looking at you and shaking their head and going, oh, mm. I really want to win that fight. And it's being, being um, smarter in that moment and going, okay, breathe, mm. shift, mm. shift into something else. And what do I want? What do I want here? I want a loving, I want a loving partner. I want a thriving relationship. And, and letting that be your compass. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Jenna is looking at you with a beaming smile right now. I mean, now, I just bro. love this guy. I mean, so he's, he's my person. <laughs> and, and to, the reason she's loving this is because she's like, and yes, I'm usually the one that has to shift us in that moment because that is going to be something that I work on for the rest of my life. Absolutely. And she does it yeah, way better than I do. the honesty. Yeah. Absolutely. The other thing we mentioned when we we're talking about core patterns was victimhood. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think particularly over the last few years, we've seen the best in humanity, we've seen the worst in humanity. And, and I'd go as far to say that these days we have a culture that, in some instances, puts victimhood on a pedestal and, and, and celebrates martyrdom. It. Thank you, martyrdom. So, again, let's approach it from two different perspectives. Where is the desire to be a victim coming from? And if somebody finds themselves playing out that pattern consistent, consistently in their life, how do they start to evolve beyond it? Again, from childhood experiences, I mean, we, <clears throat> I think that the, the thing that most people actually want is to be seen, mm. to mm-hmm. be listened to, to be heard, to be mm. acknowledged, to be understood. And, and the victim mentality comes from a place that is, that is unhealed. And, and so we often create, and I say we because we're all in this together. Yeah. You know, Brad and I will never pretend to be free from our ego. We'll never pretend to have things that we don't get to work on. I mean, this is we are, we're in this work for the rest of our life. I'm a student of life for life. And so when we find ourselves in this victim patterning or this, this habit of like, I'm a victim or poor, woe is me, it simply just comes from wanting to be heard, wanting to be mm. seen, wanting to be listened to. Mm. And... And I believe that every time we're in that space and it really is coming from a place of like I need to overcompensate, like the martyrdom, um, it's, it's, the, it's the mom who just 
never puts herself first ever, ever, ever. And she's focusing on everybody else first so that she can prove that she's worthy. Mm. It's really, she's wanting to prove that she's worthy, that she's, that she's enough, that she, through her doing this, that she is valuable. Mm. And then she has nothing left for herself at the end of the day. And then she's tired and then she becomes a victim to, well, I, I, I can't get my hair done because I don't have enough time and space and energy. And Mm. because I've just focused on so many other people, like, don't you see, don't you see how worthy I am? Don't you see how incredible I am as a mother? Um, And, and then for the, the overachiever who doesn't have enough time for self care, doesn't have enough time for relaxation or enjoying the fruits of his or her labor. I mean, at that point, is it even worth it? Of course, yes, it it is absolutely fulfilling to be able to create success and Mm. generate abundance and, and be able to have all these things. But if you also don't have the time to pause and, and share these experiences and these material items with people that you love, like what's the purpose of it anyway? Mm. So I believe that overcompensation is always driven by deficit. And so when we are overcompensating and trying to prove something, it's coming from a place of not enoughness. And that's from your childhood. That's because dad wasn't present or you weren't seen by mom or mom forgot to come to your school play that one time and it like forever etched in in your memory for the rest of time. And so we create these limitations about ourselves and these interpretations about life because we don't have the the toolbox when we're four, five, six, seven, eight years old to understand what we're experiencing. And so we create these stories to have it make sense. Mm. And oftentimes those stories are not serving us. And we start to create these these limiting beliefs about who we are and and what the people around us think about us. And we show up as unworthy and and that we don't trust ourselves. And then we create these patterns that that don't serve us. Overcompensation is always the result of deficit. Driven by deficit. I love that. And often the greater the deficit, the greater the overcompensation happens. Yeah, uh-huh. absolutely. And it's not sustainable. And that's that's the biggest thing too that we stand for is teaching people how to be how to have the, the balance of the masculine and feminine. Because mm. even for men, masculine drive is not sustainable. Mm. At some point, you must be willing to shift into your feminine there's nothing Mm. weak about it i mean think about feminine energy think about Mm. mother nature how Mm. powerful it is Uh, but to really be in harmony with yourself so much so that you're focused on that thing that you want to accomplish you get it done and then you take your foot off the gas and you're in the flow and you allow and you attract and you receive and you vibrate at the same frequency of that which you desire like that is the absolute experience of harmony so that's what we stand for yeah and i think the other side what you were you were talking to is victim is such it's so prevalent because there are rewards yeah and if people don't recognize the reward like why are we doing it if it didn't get us anything we wouldn't do it yeah but there are rewards to every victim conversation like Mm. you said with the mother that is is always giving and you know many of us have these mothers that would give their right arm for their kids Mm. what's the reward they never have to risk they never have to go out and go after their dreams. They never have to fail. Mm. You know, for the overachiever that does everything by themselves and 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 really is just got a strangle on there. What's the reward? Control. They have control over everything and nothing surprises them. There's not anything, there's not any corners that are or that there's something hidden in. There's this illusion of power that comes with it. But it's until you start seeing that the price tag that comes with that reward is is too expensive. You'll never change. And that's what we really focus on is having people see like, look, suddenly this price tag of your, you, you, if, if you're an overachiever, that's you know, it's just an absolute control freak. Well, what, what's the price tag? Stress. You stress the fuck out 24 mm. seven. And is that how you wanna be? For somebody that's always in the, like, I can't do this because, I can't do this because, or don't you see what I do? You know, the reward is you may receive acknowledgement for what you are doing and people go, yes, I see all it through. The price tag though, people think you're weak. People think that like, okay, this is a person that can't do it by themselves and that, and I don't really, I don't really trust, or you just complain all the time. You're not really that much fun to be around. So until people start seeing that that price tag for their victim stories is, is way too high, they're going to stay in it until they realize what they're getting out of it. They're never going to shift it. And that's what we are teaching is responsibility, radical responsibility. I am creating all of it. I love that point around the benefit because to a lot of people that sounds counterintuitive, but, mm-hmm. but no behavior is random, right? Mm-hmm. It, it all comes for a purpose and all receives a particular benefit. 
And so I think that's a really powerful point for people to reflect on is if I'm engaging in patterns in my life that aren't serving me, actually go in search of, well, what's the secondary benefit I'm getting out of engaging in this pattern and how do I achieve that in a healthier way? Mm -hmm. It's interesting that both of those patterns we spoke about, uh, we spoke about victimhood. What was the first one we spoke about? Trust. Thank you. Trusting oneself or others or lack of trust in oneself and lack of trust in others and victimhood both came back to childhood. Mm -hmm. And so let's say I'm running these patterns. I'm familiar with the price tag. I'm familiar with the benefit I'm getting from it. I recognize I need to go back and heal parts of myself that are clearly unresolved. How do I do that? So many ways. (laughs) So many ways. How much time do we have? (laughs) Um, I, I think that the 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 biggest thing is really being able to be in the it's a daily practice. It's not and also a big thing that we teach at ALA is forgiveness, mm-hmm. like ra- like freedom through forgiveness, radical radical self forgiveness, forgiveness of others, and um, and that doesn't happen just once. Uh, I was molested when I was six years old, mm. and I forgive my molester every day. I was mm. raped when I was twenty nine. I forgive my rapist every single day, and mm. being able to understand the what it means to actually forgive because freedom is something that we choose. It's not something that's, that we're given. I mean, it's something that we must create for ourselves and forgiveness is something that you must choose moment by moment because when we are holding on to resentment or pain or suffering, then it's kind of like, I've heard this saying before that when you hold a grudge or you're angry at somebody for something they did quote unquote to you, It's kind of like drinking poison and thinking that it's going to somehow harm the other person. Yeah. Because when we are focusing on being a victim or we're focusing on that thing happened to me, Mm. then we're not in self-awareness, self-ownership, radical responsibility. So while those things that I experienced at the time were not my fault, it's my responsibility to turn those experiences into something that's going to fuel my fire and fuel my mission because it's had me become a better leader. I mean, really understanding what it means to forgive, understanding what it means to know that I'm not my body, I'm not the experiences that I have, the interpretation that I create around the experiences I have are absolutely up to me. And when I finally looked at the what could have been the experience for both of those people, what would have them even have the thought to do that to somebody else? Mm. What have they experienced in their life? Mm. What kind of pain, what kind of suffering? It had me have a deeper understanding of compassion for humanity because everything that we experience, everything, and I mean everything, is the full spectrum of life. And and so we really get to remember that the experiences that we have are not things that are happening to us, but what we choose to interpret about these experiences are always up to us, and that's our responsibility. Yeah, talk about choosing your own response and taking responsibility for you, for you to take those events and, and, and the lesson for you becomes I developed a greater compassion for humanity I think is, a, is an exceptional example of the, the very principle that we're talking about. Um, Jenna, I love when you say I, I, I forgive them every day. You know, it, the, it's, it's a practice. I do think sometimes in personal development and business trainings and that kind of stuff we so, some, sometimes you know things can get marketed as come and we, we solve it mm-hmm. and you know I, I did the work and I've done it and you know I kind of wrapped a ribbon on it and and often that's not reality right you know I, I lost a brother I was 18 he was 21 I, we lost him to drugs and I was doing uh, two courses recently at the Meadows the Meadows have a, a public facility called Rio Retreat Center in Arizona, Mm -hmm. inner child work, relationship patterns, all that kind of stuff. And and one of the things that came up was Tom's stuff, my brother's stuff. And one of the things I said in in debriefing that was, um, because I I got upset in, you know, I wrote a letter to Tom and Mm -hmm. and got really upset in in reading that letter out loud to the group. And they said, you know, how are you feeling? And I said, you know, like a little bit, uh, a little bit disappointed, a little bit frustrated because what I'm learning, you know, I'm 35 now, so this was 17 years ago that Tom passed, is th- I don't think the sadness is ever going to be done mm-hmm. with Tom. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to process that one, moved on, did the work, 
rock and roll. I think I can process as best as I can. And then in the coming days, weeks, months, years, whatever, I'll probably build up a little bit of sadness again. And then I might do another processing uh, process in 12 months and, and mm-hmm. you know, or, or doing it daily is probably even better. But, <laughs> but my point is, is that it's a, all of this stuff is a, is a daily practice and a daily choice. And it's really refreshing, I think, to sit in front of two people. I, I, I admire the integrity of it, to be honest, to go, yeah, this, this is a daily commitment. Yeah. I, I think if, if, any, if anybody's marketing is like, you're done, you've well, arrived, done. you've transformed. That's right. all you need. Yeah. No. No. We're, there is no. It, it's always a transforming. Yes. <laughs> this is always an ongoing process, and the the bigger the game you are up to playing, and the and the more people that you're impacting in that, that's going to need to be a bigger practice because you have so many opportunities to be reminded mm. of those, those those events, to be reminded of those traumas, to be reminded of those things because you're going to have reflections of mm. so many more people that are dealing with you or dealing with you in the same situation that if you haven't, if you're just like, no, I'm done with that, <laughs> ego's going to find a way and go, you sure? Yeah, right. Like, like you think you, you got it sure? all figured out? You're just, oh, you're, you're good? <laughs> we'll see. And that's what I think is is always the the universal joke is when we think we've got it or we think we're arrived in that you know your God your universe is going what, what about this just gonna remind you or that you're just, human yeah, and you're having yeah. a human experience yeah. and then you watch you lose your shit or flip out or melt down and you're like okay I'm sorry maybe I don't have it <laughs> Brad I have never thought about it in the way that you just language it, which is when you have a big mission in life and it might be big business or big whatever going on, there's actually a lot more opportunity for your unresolved stuff to be reflected back to you. 100%. The bigger the yeah. game you play, the bigger the breakdowns you're going to have. Oh. I mean, the analogy that we like to use is, okay, so don't do this, but <laughs> <laughs> if you're driving... Don't try this out. And you're going, you know, 15, 20 miles an hour in your car on a side street. Right. How much multitasking do we do? You right. know, we might check our phone. We play with the radio. We're, we're doing things and, and all that stuff. Now imagine you're going 215 miles an hour in a Formula One car. Yes. How many opportunities? You're not multitasking, but you have a ton of opportunity for breakdown and mistake. It's, it's simply when you're playing life at a big game that comes with a big speed, there's a lot of opportunity for breakdown. There's a lot of opportunity to wreck. So with those are going to come a lot of opportunities for fears and limiting beliefs to be f- flashed in front of you mm. constantly. And that's where emotional intelligence becomes really, really important mm. in mastery of self-thought going, okay, how quickly can I shift? Because if I don't shift, if I turn a bad morning into a bad day, into a bad week, if you're a leader up to a big thing, you've got to think of like, what's the ripple? of me having a bad day or a bad week and right. wanting to be right about my victim conversation and you don't understand. Yes. That has big implica- implications. Yes. In your world. That is such a powerful point. Do you have anything to add to that? I think that uh and like what you were saying about <clears throat> you asked me the question of well, how do you resolve these childhood traumas? Um it's an it's in moment by moment every single person yeah. you encounter because yeah. everyone's our reflection. You spot it, you got it. So if you see something that triggers you, if you see something that annoys you or gets under your skin, it's like, what is what is this person reminding me of about myself? And what is this teaching me in this moment? Um, we went to, we've been to Burning Man three times and we're going again this year. Have you been? Awesome. I have not. I'll come oh, going this year. So, what, so you're basically going you're this, going. When is it? When is it? Last week Labor Day weekend. Last what? week in August, I, I will. Ma- I can be here. I will make sure go. I'm coming. Go, with you. everybody no, no, on I'm this podcast. Going. Go, brought to you by. You so we're kidnapping you. You're coming with us. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna have the best time ever. <laughs> of the it's, yes. it's it's already it's, done. You're going. Like you can't say no. <laughs> right. Um. So there was one one year that we went, and one of the art installations was this big marquee sign, like one of those big signs with the lights, and it was in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the playa. And the message that it had on there was the triggers are the guides. Mm. And that stuck with me in such a way that 
reminded, like really anchored for me what it means to be in the daily practice. Mm. Um, triggers are just really powerful reminders about what we get to focus on, what we get to work is what we get to work on. Mm. And so, uh, so I would say like really in, in kind of comparison to what Brad was saying about all that, like when you play a big game, you're going to get triggered. You're going to have breakdowns. Mm. And to be able to manage those experiences with a level of emotional intelligence where you're asking yourself, how can I be radically responsible here? What is what is the price that I'm willing to pay in order to create what I want? Mm. And there's always a win-win opportunity, I believe. I believe that something that we're learning, uh, everything we've experienced in the last couple of years as, as a culture, um, as, as people, as we're really getting back in alignment with what matters, like yes. what's really actually important. Yeah. Because a lot of things that have not been working have been flushed to the surface. Yeah. You know, it's been under the, it's been under the surface for a while. And so, so much has been exposed. We're remembering what's important is, is tribe and community and connection, being present and and really being anchored in what matters so i'm it's it's in the daily practice it's in the implementation the integration it's never over the work is never done ever mm. ever mm. ever ever mm. and uh being a partnership with our ego mm. Mm. the triggers of the guides are the same as what you're saying before in terms of the ego is the compass yeah yeah right and so as somebody who's watching this listening to this is thinking yeah i i, I can think of two or three or four or five uh, consistent scenarios where I get triggered. What advice can we give them about how to respond, things that I can do, think, feel, journal into when I get triggered? One, I think it's in the moment, can you look at this and say, on my deathbed, is this going to matter? Will this actually matter? Probably not. (laughs) In most of those things, they they probably not. And the second thing is 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 really looking at is is the interpretation because we're going to be triggered for whatever, but it's the interpretation that we make up about that event. Is this interpretation serving me? Does it make me feel better? Does it make me feel empowered, or is this making me feel like a victim? Is it making me feel mm. worse mm. in the moment? And if it's something that is not having you feel empowered, shift the interpretation. Find out how this is actually serving you. And I think a big, big thing, Jenna touched upon that, is start with compassion. Mm. Generally, if somebody's having a bad day and they react to you, it has nothing to do with you. Mm. Everybody, we're just kind of walking around in our own little bubble and trying to make Mm. the best of our day and doing all these things. If you run into somebody that triggers you or an event that triggers you, it likely has nothing to do with you. And remember that in the moment. Be like, this person's having a worse day than I am. Mm. And how can I support them? How can I how can I shift this? Or maybe this is just an opportunity for me to establish boundaries and, and realize this isn't this isn't about me and I'm not gonna make it about me. So I'm gonna step away. And the compassion piece is also really important to practice with self. Mm-hmm. Right? Very. I got triggered, I've done a little bit of work on the trigger, I go back into the same environment, and guess what? I get triggered again. It's important, right, that I don't start condemning myself, beating myself up. Rather, treat myself with compassion to acknowledge that it's a daily practice. Yeah. I, too, am learning. Yeah, for all the people that have done the work and you're like, oh, I've done all this work and I still am triggered. What am I doing wrong? How am I? Yeah, is realizing that, no, this is this is going to be a continual practice. It's a continual opportunity and and that it's you're never... You're never there. We're never done. And and constant compassion for self. And Jenna's Jenna's amazing at that. Mm. I would actually like to offer your listeners um, a really simple tool mm. to kind of pull themselves out of the self beat up or the loop or the mm. if they're finding themselves in um, an experience that they feel like they can't break a pattern. It's super simple. And I've I've coached, gosh, thousands of, of women into this from stage. It's a process that I usually facilitate when I'm speaking on stage. Um, one of the quickest ways to get back in alignment with what your truth is, is to simply make a choice. Like we make transformation so hard sometimes that like we feel like we need to have this 
gigantic, huge, massive transformational root canal level kind of extraction of the soul. And then that's how we're going to, it's like, and we can also make a new choice. Um, and so what I'll have, what I'll have people do, um, from stage, I'll have them just write for one minute about all of the mean, yucky stuff that they say to themselves. Mm. Like all the stuff that their ego says, like you're unworthy, you're not enough, you don't fit in here, you don't belong, you're stupid, you're ugly, you're a fraud, you're an imposter, like all the things. And when it's just us with us, because these internal conversations that we have, we oftentimes confuse them for truth. Like we think, that, oh, mm. I'm just being honest with myself. And like, mm. I know me and this is, and it's, it's really mean stuff. And so the thing that I really also anchor them in is that the ego is, again, our compass. And the ego simply just wants to protect our inner child. Like our, my ego wants to protect my little girl. Mm. My, my ego doesn't want to be embarrassed. My ego doesn't want to be excluded. My ego wants everybody to like me, love me, appreciate me, accept me, and have me feel like I'm enough. So, um, so they'll, they'll write for about a minute. Uh, all the things they say, like the meanest of the mean, like the worst possible things they've ever said to themselves. And then literally a minute later, they write themselves an acknowledgement letter, like what they actually know to be true about themselves. And so it's really beautiful to witness because oftentimes when they'll hold up, the, they'll, they'll put the two letters next to each other, they'll realize that the writing is actually different. So wow. that the handwriting is just, it's kind of scattered and just messy on the, on the the with the ego letter. And then when they're actually acknowledging themselves from their highest self, it's it's peaceful it's calm it's it's beautiful handwriting and so there's a clear indicator of like two different kind of frequencies and energies and then what i'll do is i'll have uh, just kind of expand on this a little bit i'll have people come up on stage and they'll read both letters to the other person so wow because we would never we would never talk that way to mm. anybody else like the way that we talk to ourselves when it's just us with us yes we would never say that yeah to anyone especially a little three-year-old mm. but the way that we talk to ourselves every day when it's just us with us is actually how we're talking to our inner child yes you're unworthy you're not enough you're an imposter you will never be enough no matter how much you do no matter what you accomplish like you'll never ever ever be enough and so imagine speaking that way to a little child mm. and so being able to have that awareness um, and, and when we're feeling kind of off kilter, we're not, we're not in alignment with our higher self, really powerful way to kind of shake that up a little bit is to just get it out so we can see it on paper and we look yeah. at it and we go, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. Like, I can't believe I talked to myself that way. Yes. And then immediately just writing yourself an acknowledgement letter. What's true? What I love about you is the way that you always show up, the, the way that the light bounces off your face, just how you carry yourself and how you make an impact in the world. So really, and getting juicy with it too and not holding back, like really giving yourself permission to acknowledge that. I absolutely love that. And you're right. There's so much power in just writing it down because yeah. so often we can ruminate on the same thoughts and have the same thought patterns for days, weeks, months, decades, you know, centuries sometimes. Um, and when you write it down on a page, you, it's kind of like you're able to see it from a bird's eye perspective almost mm -hmm. and therefore critique it more truthfully. Mm -hmm. There's power in just getting it down. Yeah. And then, as you say, the, the two letters and reading it out loud to, to, the, to your inner child and to your true self, that is super powerful. I want to talk to you guys about confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's something that... Uh, a lot of people want to develop and foster more self-confidence in themselves. Mm -hmm. We've obviously spoken a lot about childhood in a child work, which is where a lot of it starts. If we were to build on top of that for a moment, what are the strategies we can uh, arm people with to start fostering self-confidence? I think the biggest thing that sabotages our confidence is our relationship with failure and what we what we attach to, I intend to do this thing. Mm. And for many times, it may be a new skill, a new hobby, or a new something that you've never done. Yet we attach that it's got to be perfect. I've got to be the best in the world at it if I do something that I've never tried before. And if it doesn't happen, somehow I am a lesser person, that mm. I, am, I am not worthy, that I am not these things. And when we start attaching, if I try a new thing and fail, then I am worthless. No one would try anything new. The, mm. the, 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 the odds 
are too great. The risk is too great. So understanding that relationship of risk and failure has nothing to do with you. It's largely a skill set or something that you're going to be building on and realizing the only way you fail is if you quit after that time continually be what am I committed to? Mm. Because we as human beings are amazing at making commitments. What we generally terrible at is staying committed to those commitments. Mm. And confidence, I think, comes, it's simply an ego, is trying something new and at the other side of it going, oh, I didn't die. Because that's what your ego will convince you of, is that if you try this and fail, you're likely going to (laughs) die. You're going to look bad. People are going to make fun of you. Everybody on the planet is going to somehow be watching you in this moment. And if it doesn't come out perfect, and if you're not the best in the world at it, you're rejected and no one will like you forever. Yes. That's what our ego often builds these things up as, is is this is going to be some catastrophic event. But... Realizing confidence comes from risking and trying something new, realizing that you're not going to die. And then now you're building evidence of, I try new things. I get better every time I do it. I practice all the time. And having that be shifting from, I fail to, I learn, I get better. I do these things. And now your ego has evidence that you try that you work on things, that you're committed, that you move forward. And when that commitment comes, you have now established all this evidence of your life was like, look, I wasn't good at this musical instrument at one point, and now I'm better at it. I used to be scared of being on stage. And then I kept getting on stage and I got better and better and better. And now I'm pretty good at it. And it doesn't scare me in these things. I used to do this and and I was terrible at it then, but now I'm pretty good at it. Now you can start looking at these things and go, this is just my day one. And what gets really, really fun about that is suddenly that newness, you start to get excited about it. You're like, oh, this is a new thing. Mm. This is something I can't remember the last time that I was really like bad at something. This Mm. is something that's exciting for me. This is something new. Mm. And that starts driving you. And that's when the world becomes really, really fun because you start looking at new opportunities as something as an excitement factor, not like this, this failure and that this thing and that. And that's when I think people, when they, when they lose the grip that other, what other people might think of them, what other that, and that inner confidence starts to grow. That's when life becomes really, really fun Mm, i love that i love that we keep coming back to the theme of fall in love with the practice and fall in love with the process and every day is the practice you never arrive you never fully heal you know it's a it's a daily game to fall in love with the process yeah ttp trust the process Mm. and trust your process trust what you're you're setting out to achieve and know that it's not going to happen overnight that every day getting up, coming back to what you are committed to, coming back to the person that you want to be, coming back to the difference that you want to make in this world. And yes, that is going to take risk. That is going to take, there, there are going to be opportunities where you fall flat on your face, mm. where it is coming at an ego sting and mm. going, but I get back up, but I get back up. And I think it's also incremental steps because, and setting yourself up to win, creating Mm. stretchy yet attainable goals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, And, and having, and celebrating the small wins along the way because it's the small little wins that ultimately build up like that muscle of of confidence. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's like, of course, people who after New Year's, they're like, I'm going to work out nine days a week, 17 times a day, <laughs> and I'm going to do it. And then they go, all once. I eat is water. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they don't do it. They're like, see, I just, I, I can't follow through I on fail. anything. I suck. <laughs> I'm Never not mind. Adonis. Yeah. After a week, what now happened? I'm undateable, and no one's gonna love me. Everyone's I'm gonna, gonna end die. up by myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now exactly. I'm gonna die alone. <laughs> right. Loser. <laughs> yes. And it's- I can't relate to anything you guys are saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure none of your listeners can. Yeah. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> none of this is resonating. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, this is yeah, team. For those of you who are who are listening and are watching, I think this is one that you're gonna need to watch and listen to twice. There is a lot here, Brett. You mentioned a really uh, poignant term. You said ego sting, mm-hmm. and and you just spoke to this a little bit. I'm gonna ask the question again and in a, in a, in a different way. But, you know, we spoke about when you're somebody with a mission that there's going to be high highs. There's also going to be super low lows. Yeah. What advice do you guys give to people who are in the valley? 
they're, they're, they're experiencing the adversity, what do we tell them? Mm. You're not I love alone. this question. Mm. You are not alone mm. in what you are experiencing it. And we are in Austin right now, Austin, Texas. And what we have fallen in love with is the community that we have. Mm. And I think if you are a high achiever, yes, you are going to be playing at some really high odds. And there may be times when you have a normal human moment mm. where you're in the lows. And it's in those moments Reach out to people that know you, mm. that have been on the journey with you and on a similar journey that can relate to you because yeah. your ego is going to have you try to feel that you are the only one that has ever experienced this and that the only reason you're experiencing it is because of you. <laughs> you messed up. You did this. And and it's just not true. It's an ego trap. So I, I, I think it's so important to develop relationships around you that are have vulnerability and intimacy woven in them and that you consistently have like what you talked about a feedback loop from people mm. to also remind you of how great you are too yeah to remind you that look i see you what you're up to in the world matters mm. and that this may be a low point for you but i really want to remind you of who you are and what mm. you're up to because in those moments, maybe your ego won't allow you to hear it or see it for yourself. Yeah. But having that support tribe around you mm -hmm. is so important. Yeah. And also remembering that it's temporary. I mean, everything is temporary. Even the highs. The highs are yeah. temporary. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that the – especially if you're a dynamic person, if you're a leader, if you're up to big things. You know, we like to think that balance is neutrality and ease but i believe that like for the it's like this is balance because you're going to have ups and downs and the roller coaster of life is for life right and and so just hang in there hang on hold on and and lean on your tribe because we're not meant to do life alone mm -mm. and and of course like in the last however many decades we've been on this this lone wolf kind of culture yeah. building mission um you know and or mission that we we ultimately cannot do anything by ourselves i mean everyone that's created anything great in their life has been because of a tribe has been because of a team has been because of the people who are enrolled in their vision mm. um and and i think one of the biggest fears that that people have is rejection not being accepted because what that meant thousands of years ago is you're going you are literally going to die yeah if you are kicked out of the tribe yeah you gone. will not survive yeah. and so it's a reptilian brain thing where we don't allow ourselves to take big risks for the for the fear of not being accepted and not being approved of and not being a part of the tribe mm. but that's the biggest thing is like tribe is tribe especially if you are in alignment with people who have shared similar values and and what matters to you matters to them and and leaning on your tribe in, in the moments of loneliness and darkness and the dark night of the soul which we've all experienced especially for a, a dynamic leader um just surrounding ourselves with people who can be there for us and love mm. us enough to remind us of who we truly are mm. Mm. i absolutely love that such important advice a lot's spoken of purpose and, 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 and having a, a purpose for, for one to move towards and, and work towards. What, what's your guys' take on, on purpose, the importance of it, how to foster it? I mean, it's the whole reason for being born. Mm. I mean, it is, it is our only obligation on this planet is to fulfill our purpose because we're all – we are born with a purpose. We are born with a mission. And um, I think the most important thing is to not be attached to what it looks like mm. because how many times have you reinvented the vehicle? How many mm. times have you reinvented the way that it all looks? Yeah. Um, my purpose has always been to show people they can literally cause and create anything when they believe in themselves, when they love in themselves enough. And that's looked many different ways. I was a, a, a personal trainer for celebrities many years ago. And what inspired that was I woke up from a, a head trauma accident, um, a coma from a head trauma accident. And and in that experience, in the the self-belief and knowing that I could overcome these, these challenges and recover from brain damage, I mean, when I believed in myself enough and I loved myself enough to know that I could do it, it inspired this mission to be a leader and to use my voice and to empower people to not only believe in themselves, but love themselves enough to find their purpose and to fulfill mm -hmm. their mission. And so that's looked many different ways. I was a personal trainer once upon a time, and now I'm facilitating leadership trainings for people from all over the planet. And um, I think that's the biggest thing is to not being attached to what it looks like, because 
we all have something that really, really speaks to us and really is important to us and allowing ourselves to be surrounded by people who also want to help foster that. Do you believe purpose is found or created? I believe it's discovered. Yes. It's it's uncovered. It's realized. It's How? through experiences, through trauma, yeah. through yeah. heartache, through pain. And you know what you were speaking about with your with your friend who you lost 17 years ago? Mm. Your sadness and your grief is simply a reflection of how much you loved him. Mm. Like the level, the magnitude of that, mm. it really is just paired with how much he mattered to you and how important he was to you. Mm. And so to really be in relationship with that, that sadness and that grief, and know that somehow, some way, that's also going to fuel your mission Yeah, in, in some capacity the love that you felt for him and also the grief that you experienced having mm. him not be here with you in mm. the way that he he decided to leave this planet mm. um i think is is a testament to the magnitude that you have to hold for people like your mm. your capacity your leadership and the way that you love humanity mm. and so i believe that our our heartache and our sadness and our trauma and and the the pain that we encounter is sometimes one of the most powerful ways for us to really discover and, and uncover our purpose. Mm. And it really comes back to what we've been talking about the whole time, really, which is, uh, you know, the, the the triggers point you in the right direction mm-hmm. and, and the ego is the compass. Uh, life, you know, l- use every experience in life as a transformative experience. Use every experience in life and your response to it to guide you towards discovering your purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really powerful i want to finish on joy mm-hmm. um we've spoken a lot about how you never healed and you never arrive and and there's this and i think i, I i'm paraphrasing but you said you know you learn to learn to love life learn to love the roller coaster the roller coaster is always going to be here how do we find joy in our day to day and I'd, I'd love to ask this question of both of you if i may I think one gratitude mm. coming back to gratitude mm. you know if if you're listening to this podcast right now or watching it you are sitting pretty well in life yes you know it, it's it's we have you know for for many of us you know we uh, for, i'll speak for myself you know I, I woke up this morning in a house yeah people don't have that <laughs> yeah, there are right. people in this world don't have that i i right. i had water i have food I have things like that. I have amazing friends. I have an incredible partner to do mm. life with. I have an amazing child with another one on the way. And and being in gratitude for every moment because we get in this illusion that you know that we have forever. Mm. And we don't. Mm. Tomorrow is not granted to us and we want to put it off. We want to do those things. But truly recognizing the amazing things that we have available to us today. Mm. What can I be grateful for today? What am I grateful for in this moment? Mm. And and no different than our, our, our brains are looking out for trouble or for warning signs. You can train your brain to start looking for gratitude, to amazing moments doing that. And that's a daily practice of that. If, if, you're, if you're someone that is, is struggling and you find yourself in a bit of a rut right now, start doing a gratitude list at the end of the day, 10 things that you're grateful for every day and do that for the next month and see how radically better your life gets when you're seeing like, oh my God, the sunrise this morning was incredible. The joy that which my little boy playing and his laughter brought me, the food that I just had, oh my God, the meal, whatever it is that you can start, really start paying attention to. And then suddenly things like getting cut off in traffic or a missed deadline that didn't happen or a date that fell through, some of that stuff just doesn't matter as much and it just doesn't sting. You're just like, uh, you know, amazing moment with my wife and kid or somebody cutting me off in traffic. Right. Yeah, you know, when you start looking now at that, I have it's the like, choice, what, what am I going to choose? Yeah. Now that I know I have the choice, what am I going to choose? Yeah, and start looking at those things. And I think when you start doing that, the joy, it becomes an environment. Yes. It's not something that it's really, it's just this is the only thing I allow in my environment, mm. my container. When I start living in gratitude, the only thing that can live here is joy. Mm. Because of the perspective and the interpretation of everything around you. Mm. And that daily list helps develop your practice, right? Because if at the end of the day you're writing down 10 things you're grateful for, you do that three or four days, you're going to wake up on day five and you're going to be actively searching for things to be grateful for. Yeah, that's your ego's job is to be right 
about whatever it's thinking about. <laughs> that is your ego's only job is to be right. So train it to look for the good. <laughs> yeah, it, look like if you're somebody that struggles with a worthiness conversation or someone that struggles with this and you're working hard and, and it's not being acknowledged, you're going to look at this and go, yeah, I knew it. I knew it just wasn't this. Mm. But if you're waking up and you're like, I make a difference in the world. I My work matters. Mm. And then suddenly around you, your boss or somebody says, hey, good job. Your ego is going to go, I knew it. I yes. knew I make a difference. Yes. So start programming what your ego can be right about. Yeah. It's either a downward spiral yeah. or an upward spiral and, and we can control. And you're which, the author. You're the author. Yes. I love that. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. I, Joy is my, I, I'm a joy, joy dealer. dealer. Yeah. I, I, like, I can tell. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I love to be the source of joy for people. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm a giant five-year-old. I just, I love life. I mean, I literally have it tattooed on my, on my wrist. Love life. Wow. Um, when I woke up from my coma, uh, I had someone give me a necklace that said love life on it. And I wore it for many, many years. Wow. And um, then I now have it tattooed on my wrist. But, uh, but yeah, joy for me is, is kind of my default. Um, and I also make a very clear specific intention to create joyful experiences mm. and i go above and beyond i'm over the top i mean at burning man i will likely change four times in the same day <laughs> like i have the most outrageous Costume changes yeah yes. literally i i'm a unicorn all week long like i'm just i'm i'm just over the top so so I, I, I really, that's something that's kind of my default. Joy is my default. Mm. Um, but it always wasn't that way. And I, and I think that I've, through the challenges I've experienced in my life, I've gotten really clear about if I am the author of my life, mm. how can I make this more vibrant, more colorful? How can I have this experience be exactly what I want it to be? So I'm just over the top. I just, I'm, I'm just crazy. And you choose it. <laughs> I do choose it. And that's, that's the big thing is it's, it's a choice. Yeah. If you're not having fun in life, choose something different. Mm. You know, and, and this comes back to the victim thing that we were talking about. Where people are like, well, mm. you don't understand. Uh, mm. Yes, your, your circumstances may be different than those around you, mm. but it is a choice. Mm. And it can be difficult in those moments, but choose something that moves you at least one step closer to where you want to be. Mm. And do that every day. Eventually, you'll be there. Mm. Tim, if you're watching this or listening to this, please do yourself the favor of continuing this journey with Brad and Jenna. This has been an exceptional conversation. For those that would love to continue this conversation with you guys, where do they best go to continue the conversation? You guys can stalk me all over social media. <laughs> I am the only Jenna Phillips Ballard in the world. There are many Jenna Ballards and many Jenna Phillipses, but only one Jenna Phillips Ballard. Um, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook that way. And uh, Brad is just not in social media. It's not his thing, which is totally amazing. And I love that I love about that. him. Yeah. Or you know, stalk us on uh, ALA. Yeah. ALA, all things social. Ascension, yeah. Ascension, Ascension Leadership Academy. Leadership Academy. Ascension Leadership Academy yeah. on Instagram. Um, if you want to check out our website, it's alaeq.com. Mm -hmm. Super easy. And we'd love to hear from all of you, of course. And thank you so much for having us. It was so fun hanging out with you. I, I do want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you both so much for bringing all of yourselves today. Uh, I, 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 I am in a fortunate position where I meet a lot of really amazing people and, and this conversation in particular has resonated with me as I'm sure it has with the entire audience at a very, very deep level. And I think a lot of that is it, it, it's so fundamentally true and I think the truths of what you're sharing are self-evident and they can be felt. Um, and so I really want to thank you both from the bottom of my heart. If you're listening to this, what you weren't able to see is when Jenna was speaking about Brad before, she had tears in her eyes. She was almost crying. And then when she spoke about my brother Tom passing away, she had tears in her eyes and she was almost crying. And so it's really obvious to me sitting in a room with you guys just how much you genuinely care and just how big your hearts are. Mm. And so I want to honor that and thank you for the work that you do and, and, and anything that we can do to, to hold you up or provide this platform is, is an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you, brother. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Cannot guys. wait to experience life with you. And Burning Man. Yes, it's happening. Like <laughs> life changing. Life changing. I'll if you're listening to this, go. Oh, it's the best. You yeah, we're, we're kidnapping you. away from this podcast, it's go to Burning Man. You can't say no. <laughs> Tune into part two from Burning Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you do three quick things to ensure you continue on this journey of growing into the very best version of yourself. Number one, hit the subscribe button and make sure you've got notifications turned on. Number two, check out more videos up here that you could watch right now. And number three, stay connected. Follow me over on Instagram at Jack Delosa or head to the-entourage.com in order to join a movement of 550,000 seven and eight figure business owners. I look forward to seeing you there.